Lincoln's Film Festival. Vision Maker Media is a native nonprofit located in Lincoln, Nebraska in the United States. Vision Maker Media empowers and engages native people to share stories. VMM envisions a world changed and healed by understanding native stories and the public conversations they generate. Reaching the general public and the global market is the ultimate goal for the dissemination of native produced media that shares native perspectives with the world. VMM continues to showcase the most compelling native stories for public broadcasting and on local PBS stations and online. Today, I'll be moderating a Q&A for Moroni for President with Jasper Rishan and Moroni Benali. Major festival sponsors include the Lincoln Journal Star, Woodland Voices Flute, Lux Center for the Arts, Native American Calling, National Native News, Indigi-FI, NV1, FNX First Nations Experience, NET, Nebraska's PBS and NPR stations, Woods Charitable Fund, Humanities Nebraska, the Lincoln Community Foundation, Lincoln Arts Council, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Cooper Foundation, the Rice Foundation, the Cherokee Nation Film Office, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Jasper, Moroni, thank you for being with us today. Um, for our attendees, I'd like to point out there are two features within the Zoom that will allow you to ask questions. There's a Q&A feature. You can post questions there. You can also just use the chat feature and we'll be watching in both of those spaces for questions as they come up. I have some questions today, but I really encourage our attendees to um, chime in and ask some questions of these people and the marvelous film that they're here representing. So I think the first question I'd like to ask is, um, what was it like filming your first documentary and being featured in a documentary for the first time? Jasper, you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, sorry. I was like, yeah, technically you were all, we were both filming our first documentary, both Morona and me and Sila, my co-director, uh, who couldn't be here today and sends her regards to everyone. Um, uh, it was a first experience for all of us because we, Sila and I started this a long, long time ago um, in uh, the fall of 2013, I would say we started thinking about this um, when we were um, doing our masters in documentary film and uh, we were looking for subjects and then um, through a long ways we found Moroni who's obviously an incredible character and we had a very, very scary Skype call with him at first. Uh, we slowly had to convince him uh, that this might be worth you doing. And then we finally went out and met him in Seattle. So it was, it was a first for all of us. Great. Moroni, what was it like being the, the featured person in documentary? It was a big experience. It, it, it was. And, and, and I think uh, both Jasper and Sila um, did a remarkable job, honestly. Um, in 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 creating this this story and and sort of weaving in these three narratives, but getting back to what Jasper was saying, I was um, living in Seattle at the time, and I think I was teaching um, in some graduate program. Uh, yeah, 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 I was. It's, it was it was quite a while, some years ago, and I got this email because I had, had intended to run for president of the Navajo Nation. Um, and had put out things online and I got an email sometime in um, fall, I guess, of 2013 uh, from these two, in my mind, two white kids from Columbia wanting to do another piece. And the first thought is, yeah, that's not going to happen. I'm like, there's too many people who are not Native attempting to tell our story and they tell it wrong. They emphasize the stereotypical tropes. They're not critical or intersectional or informed by like these settler colonial realities. And so I sort of just pushed it off. And so they, they were persistent um, and they got back to me and we, gosh, had a phone, a call. So I guess it was several emails just going back and forth because what I wanted in terms of getting to your question, Abby, was I wanted to make sure um, 
uh, both Jasper and Sila at least understood my my at least understood understood my my um, uh, um, concerns and and uh, over the course of I guess maybe almost a month and a half two months maybe and finally kind of culminating in a Zoom call um, I felt I felt that both Jasper and Sila had um, um, had a degree of cultural fluency and in um, and uh, uh, respect and understanding that they would do uh, justice to this story in a way that would not reify or perpetuate or reproduce a lot of these stereotypes about Native America, about Native Americans, about gay, just about the whole thing. And so, um, yeah, and so in the beginning, that's how it was. And so that sort of set the stage uh, of just sort of me feeling comfortable with them for the most part. I mean, after some months of a camera in my face every day, it gets a little annoying, but um, <laughs> and Jasper, I apologize. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> right. But but in the end, it really was that beginning um, uh, initial uh, in, in exchange between both Jasper, Sila, and myself that I think sort of set not only uh, the tone for like collegiality, but also set the tone in terms of of what we sort of hope to get out of this. Yeah, I mean. I still can't imagine what it would have been like for you to go from never having filmed with anyone or, or like you've done never for this to this extent to then filming every single day. Because typically if you were to shoot a documentary with someone, you film a couple of days, you give them a break, you film a couple of days, you give them a break. But if you're filming a campaign, there are no breaks. Right. And Moroni, I was campaigning every day. You do not know what's going to happen every day. So you're going to go. So when we, we, we tried to come as much as possible, and I, feel we, I think we filmed like 50, 60 shoot days with Moroni. Uh, and like from sunrise until sometimes the moment he would go to bed, even sometimes the moment you woke up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, those moments too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for letting us um, follow you and trusting us to tell your story. And it's, uh, it's an excellent documentary. I hope that all of our attendees have already had the opportunity to see the film. Uh, and if not, I hope after this Q&A, they go online to view the film. Um, I was really impressed with the story and the storytelling. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting story of someone sort of bucking the system in some ways. And, um, it, it was just really well done. So how many, if you filmed 50 to 60 days, how much um, film did you have then to edit down to the, the, the ultimate documentary you ended up with? A, a lot, because also again, Sila and I, this was our very first time making a feature film. Sila had made some other things before. For me, it was my very first time picking up a camera. So we, uh, most of the time, didn't know what we were doing in terms of storytelling or even figuring out the camera. So we were running the camera all day long and on two cameras. So then you come home with like 10, 12 hours of footage per day, X 40, X 50, 60 days. It was a lot. So it took us a long, long, long time. We at first crammed out like an initial version in order to be able to graduate, but then we worked on it for another couple of years. And thanks to Vision Maker and ITVS, we were able to come back out and sort of deepen the story. And um, that ultimately led to the final piece, but it was, it was a years long editing process for us. So talk a little bit about um, how you decided which aspects of the story you would include and Moroni, what your role was in that also in terms of the interplay between subject and director in sort of talking through what were the really important things that you wanted to make sure didn't get left out? Um, I, I, I think, or Jasper, correct me if I'm wrong, in that first couple maybe weeks that we were going back and forth, I had sort of suggested that a condition of my participation was that the storyline, whatever, would be run by a critical native scholar. And in this case, it was Jennifer Danette Dale. Dr. Yeah. Jennifer Nedale out of University of New Mexico, 
um, well-known queer in, in, indigenous historian. Well, she's not queer, but she does queer history. Um, and and Jasper and Silo were very good, at least, I, mean, I, I never really gave a lot of input. I just trusted them because I had tr entrusted them to these other people that I really trusted it as well. Um, so, I mean, and, and I, Jasper, feel free to talk about that end because that's the part I was not involved in. No, she, she was she was absolutely gold to work with, and I was going to make sure to mention her as well. And 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 uh, yeah, and then in terms of what parts of story we wanted to tell, we were obviously also intrigued by Moroni's Moroni's backstory um, as a queer Mormon, and um, uh, we were struggling to find a way to fit that in the film because there were so many other important uh, things to talk about, especially because Moroni himself didn't want the campaign to be about. Uh, or focus on that because um, of all the other important issues that were actually at stake. And uh, I hope that sort of that that journey we try to relate with this film as well. There's all of this, and then there's Moroni's backstory. But here's a reason why he's not bringing that out into the front forefront. I think the film does a good job with that. We 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 get to know Moroni in that way, but it it's never. Um, it's never a central part of the campaign. And I, I understand the, the thought process there. Um, so it's an interesting film in that it, it happens to be about someone who is gay, but it's not a stereotypical gay story. Um, although we learn about your background, uh, Moroni, we were not, um, delving too deeply into some of those things. And there's a scene um, that was very emotionally poignant for me um, at a rally where your um, parents invited the missionaries to come and you sort of walk out of the, the, the shot. And that um, was so poignant to me, but we don't then really dive into that with you. Um, but it was a beautiful moment to just sort of like, and to see you sort of just walk away. And I wonder if you want to expand now on, on what that experience was like and, and. Yeah, that, 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 I mean, it, it, my story as a gay Mormon is not untypical from, from most other stories. It follows the same sort of patterns, but um, that, that was a moment when, when, when Jasper and Sila had initially reached out to me, I was in the process of sort of negotiating my membership in the Mormon church and whether or not I wanted that to continue. It was also this moment where I started to embrace my own sexuality and kind of like lean into that authenticity. Um, and it was also a place of just like dealing with a lot of that emotional trauma and trying to work through that of having like gone through conversion therapy for years and having like all of that. And so Jasper and Sally sort of showed up at that moment where I had just started the process with therapy to kind of address that, but had never really finished. And so what you see with these reactions um, where they may have been animus involved of me walking away from the more missionaries, it was more of like, just, I don't want to engage that part of me that brings up so much pain at that time. And now years later, after a lot, a lot more therapy, um, I can talk about that without the pain. I can sit with people who used to say painful and hurtful things like church mem Mormon church members and be okay with it. But in that moment, I was still processing and trying to, trying to figure out what, where I belonged in, in that landscape that I, I grew up in. Um, and so that's kind of where Jasper and Sila kind of, um, came in and that's where those missionaries with those because it was just it was over a three month period that they just sort of followed me and it was those three months where just a lot happened like my life got turned upside down in all different ways um <laughs> so um and that's yeah. when we like, can we film you every day for the next 50 days How's yeah, that? <laughs> that's true <laughs> there's not enough going on let's just throw this in there too oh, and yeah. and right and i i have had friends who run for political office and i've heard from them just the campaigning alone throws everything up in the air and really mixes up your life um a lot and so um and we see you um traveling and going to all these different events and i i wonder um 
like just what sort of a toll and you say you're also at this time coming to grips with your sexuality and your membership in the church and there just had to be a lot of emotional turmoil and work going on during your campaign that you handled so gracefully i thought at least on camera no that, that that's that's very kind of you abby very kind of you to say um and um yeah jasper you want to give your observations <laughs> um no i know i but what Wait, hold on. Rephrase. What? What should we? Where should we t tack on here? Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I'm, I'm trying to like just think through the question, Abby. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Perfectly all right. We didn't have questions beforehand, and so this is more of a conversation, and that was a pretty deep one. So, um, feel free to take your time with that and sit with the question for a little while. I'm gonna look and see. I don't see any questions in the chat and nothing in the Q&A yet. But we do have people. It shows me we have attendees listening, so that's good. Oh, it's good great. to know when you're broadcasting whether there are folks out there. And and we do have folks, so I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you rephrase the question? I apologize. Sure. I mean, Not a problem. I, I just um, I had mentioned that I have known people who um, run for political office and just the aspect oh, oh, of campaigning alone right, is, right, right. throws everything up in the air and to have so much other stuff happening just to talk a little bit about um, right. how you managed that. So so I uh, honestly, I, I, it may have come across very well that I managed, I mean, it may have, it, and it did come across very well, like I was just in a very good place, but I mean, I can look back now, what, seven years later, and sort of like see the toll of dealing with like the depression and like the sadness and the loneliness and the feelings of just like uh, um, uh, of like unworthiness that sort of just came part and parcel of just having grown up as this gay kid in a Mormon church, but not knowing how to get out of that, but also knowing I was um, two spirit as well. And just these Navajo, so, and, and when Jasper and Sila had just shown up at that time, um, they, they honestly were a welcome ref uh, uh, um, distraction, um, even though I was very critical with their engagement to begin with, because it really took the distraction away from like trying to actually deal with what was going on. Because oftentimes behind the cameras, those were, there's, those were moments where I just did a lot of things that were not healthy for me. Um, did a lot of things that were, um, and, and, they, and those were just risky behaviors that are reflective of someone who is not really processed and worked through a lot of that. And so that was kind of happening at the same time. And so for me, um, the campaigning was just a welcome distraction from all of that. And so when they, when, whenever I stopped being busy with the campaign, that's when I felt I had to force to address those things that I hadn't addressed before that may have come up just briefly in the film, but that's kind of like what was happening while this was being filmed. And in those moments when I wasn't campaigning, it was, it was just, it was honestly just bad news for me. Um, I didn't have a very good relationship with alcohol <laughs> at that time. And I can laugh at it now because like years later in this therapy of just like going through this, I just recognized like just the turmoil and sort of that, all of that darkness that was happening at the time. And so the campaign was sort of a welcome distraction to keep me away from that. And also knowing that this was gonna be on film also just sort of checked my behavior saying, okay, I need to like um, figure out a way to start addressing what's going on. But also it just, yeah, I, it was just sort of a really welcome distraction. But at the same time, it really hit a lot of those really deep uh, desires and passions I had to help the Navajo people. Uh, now I, I look back now and I'm like, um, someone needs to be in a healthy place before they can like rich reach and lift someone else. Mm -hmm. But that campaign was really something that, and that, and that whole period for, from when that campaign started to just even just, uh, uh, within the last year has been sort of like call that sort of like my, my growing period. <laughs> 
where I was just sort of coming into my own. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this campaign was sort of the distraction, but it was also me trying to figure out who I was. And then I ended up running for, I ran up, ended up running again for office here in, in Utah. I ran for district, uh, for uh, city council. Um, and, and, and just, I don't know, it's, that, that, at that time, that wasn't a distraction. It was just more reflective, like I want to serve, I want to be able to find ways to help the people around me. Um, mm. But yeah, but getting back to, getting back to that period of campaigning, that's what I wanted to do, but I was so distracted by everything else. And it was just, it was a very difficult, honestly, a very difficult uh, few years for me during that period. Mm. Yeah. Um, I do have some questions in the Q&A at this point. And um, before I get to those, Jasper, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I like, uh, uh, first of all, it's nice to hear, Marna, that we were somewhat of a welcome distraction, um, despite the long days we made uh, with you. But also, I don't think people realize when you're campaigning, just the physical toll it takes, because the, especially in the Navajo Nation, the distances are so long, and you would easily be doing two, three events a day like a flea market in Morgan and then to a chapter house and then to another one and then to a meeting in Window Rock, um, the capital. And, and you'd be driving sometimes 10 hours a day just to get all of that. Uh, and then for us, that was the first, I had just gotten my driver's license. So that was the first sort of getting up really early, trying to keep the pace behind Morona. Um, Cause it's a certain style to drive. And, uh, and, and uh, it was just, um, uh, you know, I don't think just as a context of you know, how hard it can be to, only just only physically to to get to all these places to run a campaign honestly by the time i got to election day because we had been to so many places i was like he's gonna win <laughs> like, at, at, he's like it's going to be joe Sherman and him number one and two and then you came in 12 and i was like what just happened <laughs> you've been that thing so then you lose because when you're in the middle of it you lose track you don't know you don't really know what's going on outside of it and there was no real polling so, um, yeah, <laughs> but like, it was just like, it was, it was amazing to be a part of it. With me. Yeah. So I do have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, they are both for Moroni. Um, did you think the camera crew following you helped your progress in the campaign? And would you let a camera crew follow you again if you were to run for office another time? I mean, the simple answer for both is yes. Mm. Um, but the answer to the second question is if and only if they meet the same conditions that both Jasper and Sila did mm -hmm. met. Um, I, I've, I have said no to a number of other, not, I mean, not documentaries, but just other people wanting to be on camera or tell part of the story just because I don't trust the filmmakers. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of did it help the campaign? Absolutely. Uh, just just the optics of having a white film crew around my campaign um, in Navajo politics legitimized me as a legitimate contender <laughs> before anyone um, saw me because no other campaign had media following them around. Cool. Or, or what, what was um, assumed to be media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was the only one and that definitely did help because of the like, well, why why does this guy have the interests of these media and these ones don't? Let's take a listen. Um, and so it definitely did help. Um, and that's a good question because I didn't realize that until just now. So Jasper, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And another question has come, um, can you talk about your campaign in terms of your effort as an outsider to break up the old guard establishment and the impact it had on the tribe and the way members are looking at now looking at tribal politics? Right. So, so one of the things that I think is really brilliant about the, this film that both Jasper and Sila um, made is it, it really captures a lot of the tensions within like the Navajo Nation itself. Um, these tensions that revolve around identity, that revolve around um, um, the, 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 the right way to decolonize, the appropriate amount of colonization. I mean, all these different things, just these tensions between generations, between um, cultural knowledge holders who want to like do all of that and others who want to do, I mean, it's just, the film really just brought um, to the front, at least for everyone to see, is just like how diverse and complex 
um, Navajo identity is. So, I mean, oftentimes the outside, we just see Navajo and we think of this monolith, but what the film did was open the door and just peek into how sort of chaotic identity can really be. Um, because they're, they're telling I me, mean, for heaven's sakes, the story is about a gay Navajo um, Mormon <laughs> man. I mean, ostensibly three contradictory spaces, but somehow the film tells a story. It tells a story of Zachariah Joe, who is incredibly traditional, but yet a Bible thumping Christian at the same time, and loves to host drag drag uh, drag shows. Like, I mean, <laughs> or just pageants. I mean, it, it, and so what I think this film did in terms of of what it did for the Navajo Nation, or just what my campaign did, was was really sort of get at these larger questions and, and at least try to ask those larger questions of, uh, for example, like even right now, the Navajo Nation has a bureaucratic um, and an administrative uh, um, uh, system where they had received over $700 million in, in the CARES Act funding earlier this year, and it took them six months to work through their bureaucracy to even start spending. And they have what now, what, 90 days, I mean, 120 days left to spend that much money. And so, so things like that. So when I talked about the old guard in the Navajo Nation, it was like, how do we disrupt these systems and these um, sets of, of, of institutions that really hinder um, uh, the ability to provide services to those who are in desperate need of it? Um, and it was really looking at, at what I, the campaign was really looking at those things of like, is the Navajo Nation really on the path to exerting sovereignty or are they just acquiescing? Um, and, and sort of these questions. And, um, and so for me, I think uh, my campaign at least raised some of those questions and at least gave, um, at least during the campaign, uh, legitimized a dialogue about sovereignty and what it might actually look like. Whereas others would passively refer to sovereignty. Our campaign was like, that was number one priority. And it, and it sort of shifted the conversation because I think it raised people, it raised legitimate fears about loss of like material, the, the material consequences of what I was saying. Um, and so, but, but yeah, I mean, it's been seven years now. Um, and I think the lasting impact of this campaign, one or two of them, was it allowed younger people a voice to start actually uh, believing they can impact tribal government and, and tribal communities. And two, um, um, I, I think this, this uh, one of the lasting impacts is just there's a, a new uh, nomen, nomenclature, uh, nomenclature that, that sort of evolved and came about. So part of now the political lexicon of the Navajo Nation is like, old guard and new guard <laughs> and so so yeah so there there are some lasting impacts yeah yeah and i i, I just to add to that i think what moroni did on the navajo level um uh is, is sort of echoed by what happened on the national level with bernie sanders even though he came in 12th he really was a disruptive factor in the navajo nation and the election and uh, to the end where way after Morona it was already uh, the primary is over people were still talking about uh, new guard versus old guard kind of taking it out the contest takes and uh, running with it but it very much had an impact and, and we only hope that there's more Moronis to come to run for office yeah and we have a comment in the chat that said um, that that's a great achievement right, to start that conversation is to see that conversation carrying on that disruption and that energizing of the younger generation to be a part of the political process and to impact their communities. Um, that's, that is a great achievement. That's definitely um, something that's worthy. Um, Jasper, this is a question in our Q&A. Um, you mentioned that you let the camera roll, which produces a ton of footage to sift through. While you're in the editing room, what did you learn about your shooting schedule and how you would change shooting practices differently for your next project? <laughs> wow, that's a very confronting question. I mean, you don't have to roll all the time, okay? 
it's okay to sort of pause and, and re re reassess. Like we were filming as Marona was coming out of the car to go to the gas station. We, but you know what? Most of that, we use some of it. So it's like, it's like I don't know. I'm also a big believer in just rolling because you, you, you're, you're following real life. You don't know what's going to happen. You might be, he might indeed, Marona might just be getting gas, but then a voter might come up and it might turn into an amazing conversation and stuff like that happens. Like, but we kind of had to keep him mic'd up all day because you're running a campaign. You don't know what's going to happen. There might be like a wild other candidate coming up to him. There, another reason you should always film way after the election was long over. Uh, like the votes have been counted, the, the victors have been celebrated. We're still rolling around with Moroni on the parking lot. Like I think other filmmakers would have long gone home. And then uh, the, the campaign manager of Joe Shirley, who had won the election, comes up to Moroni and says, we'll need a vice president. And we had Moroni mic'd up. We had it on a nice Zoom. And we got his, he basically got offered the VP slot. And Moroni said, no, on camera. So case in point, always keep rolling. <laughs> That was a great moment, too. That... Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Vice President of the Valley. Well, th there are other times where I would drive intentionally much faster just so I could lose the film crew because I just got so tired of them. <laughs> <laughs> and we just like, like, these, these, right. The, the, these, the, the it was just, I mean, you, I don't know if anyone's been to the Navajo Nation, but it's just vast. It's like, it, it'll take about a good seven hours of just driving about 70 miles to get from one end to the other. Um, yeah, and so I, yeah, there are times when I just needed to be alone and I would just drive very, very, very fast and lose the camera crew. <laughs> I apologize, Jasper. <laughs> I mean, again, that was my first time driving that summer and I really, like, I can drive anywhere now. <laughs> it's the best ever, but you're gonna like, you're like, you're, cause you're constantly going around, call, like it was, it was, uh, it was a challenge. Something <laughs> lost you and that's okay. <laughs> you do see the beauty of the land and the landscape in the film. I thought that was captured. Um, there were some really lovely um, landscape shots or shots of Moroni sort of walking in the in the landscape and um, that's nice. It, that was really nice to see. It's very different from Nebraska um, but Nebraska is also a, a large geographical state and it does take um, you know a, about that seven hours or so to drive from one uh, border of the state to the other. Um, so we're, we're sort of used to that a little bit, but um, it does pose some challenges, right? And uh, makes sense that you would sometimes drive a little fast to have that just alone time um, there. Yeah, and I mean, just, and just uh, from a te filmmaking technical perspective, it's so easy to throw in a couple drone shots to make it look pretty, uh, but we have to somehow relate the vastness of it to, to again, go back to how, how grueling doing this campaign is and how just to relate how, how, how vast these distances are. So that's, that's why we use a lot of those shots. Mm -hmm. So you, um, you do go on after the election and, and feature some about Zach and Zach and the pageants. And uh, someone had asked um, if you knew how Zach was doing now. Um, he, we, we actually, um, there's, a, for anyone that wants to know more about Zach, uh, there is a, a short called Mr. Navajo that's on Nowness um, that follows Zach's story. Because we had, we, we, we kind of ran into Zach, literally ran into, he walked into our shot uh, with President Shelley. He was the executive assistant. And in the parade, he walked with a Shelley banner into our shot and we were like, who is this one? And uh, we started talking to him and then uh, went home to him to uh, uh, film an interview with him. Because uh, it was obviously fascinating that he, the character that he is, he was working for the incumbent president that Moroni was running against. Um, and yeah, so for, if you want to know more about him, look up the short Mr. Navajo. And he's doing well now. He, he wrote the other day and he wants Mr. Navajo part two, so. Um. Interesting. Interesting. He was um, quite a personality and uh, it was good. And I really enjoyed watching his um, shift from sort of feeling like 
the you know the elder voice was the more important voice to actually then him running for an office uh, himself. And I thought that was really a credit, Moroni, to your um, campaign and you sort of bringing up those questions about what it means to serve and to um, to want to make an impact in your community. And I thought. Um, that's, you know, that that's an achievement also to, to watch this young man um, sort of make a shift. And um, yeah, those young voices, I think, are very important. So bring a new perspective. Um, I mean, just to exemplify that, uh, the uh, we filmed uh, 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 Zach's campaign two years after we filmed Morona's campaign. And Zach still says, I'm new garden, you're the old garden. <laughs> Kind of takes it out of context, but it is it is like Marona's um, phrases have lasted. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. was your favorite part of filming or or being a part of this documentary process for either one of you? I think it, it would have been just really getting to know Marona on the very few times that we had when the we actually turned the camera off. Um, you know, and, and really just like, it is such an intimate process to really, because you have to fully get to know someone in a short or, or you know, uh, as, as well as possible in a very short amount of time. And uh, that's a very strange thing about this thing called filmmaking. Um, and I hope it wasn't always annoying. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know if there was like a, a favorite part for me Mm -hmm. oh, okay. um, and I apologize, I, I, and Jasper knows this, I, I have so much more appreciation after the fact because I didn't know what it would be, but if I'm honest during that period, it was, it, it was, it was really sort of just a utilitarian thing for me. It's like, oh, here's this group, they're doing their thing. Um, I'm going to give them that buffer to do that, but I really want to do my thing. Um, and just they're around. And so th I don't know if there really was a favorite part, but it was sort of the aftermath after they came back and they continued. Um, and then when I saw the film itself, um, what I recognized was that both Jasper Silent and those that they had worked with really internalized a lot of what um, was said to them. Um, and, and that was just really, um, uh, at least at least for me, that, that was one of the more um, just uh, satisfying um, moments of that entire process was just, just to know that these two filmmakers somehow were able to capture the voice that resonated and and really touched on a lot of of, of the discord that's happening within native communities themselves. Um, so so yeah, the process itself, I, I don't know if there was a favorite part, but in terms of afterwards, it was just incredibly compelling um, and uh, very, very impressive as well. So yeah, how I, important, oh, go ahead, Jasper. No, I, I, I just, I just to add on like what was favorite, uh, you know, about the favorite part for me would have also be getting to know all of Moroni's family and they really welcomed, welcomed us in and we met his brother and sisters and parents and his nephew, nephew Kino, who became one of our composers together with Ryan Dennison. So it's like this whole, they, they opened their world to us and that to this day feels very special. Mm. Yeah. So how important is it to have um, organizations like Vision Maker Media and, and how does that uh, help bring these stories forward? Um, it's, it, 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 it's instrumental without Vision Maker, who was our very first funder. Because like, we tried to get funding for this. We made this originally, it started as a student project and we knew it was such a strong story, we wanted to take it further. Uh, but try selling a, a story about a, a gay Mormon Navajo, it's so neat that everyone's trying to tick their boxes. Everyone's like, not sure, uh, too obscure. But we knew it was such a strong story and it was worth telling. Uh, that we that, and then we met through Billy Luther, who became our executive producer. Um, we got uh, put in touch with Vision Maker, and we applied. And they were our very first one. They're taking taking a risk on two completely unknown filmmakers about an unknown person. And then we got ITVS as well on board, which is fantastic. And uh, without 
either of them, this film would have never seen the light of day outside of school classrooms. Mm -hmm. It allowed us to go back, you know, at so many times to deepen the story and to really broaden the scope of what this film could have been and now is. So it, it is absolutely uh, uh, would have been impossible without Vision Maker. Cool. Um, uh, in the chat, um, someone is asking, what is Moroni having become such an influencer working on now? And is it still something benefiting native folks? Oh, um, yeah. So uh, after, after the election, um, I ended up <laughs> becoming the, uh, I don't know what the audience, well, so equivalent to what is the secretary, secretary of the interior, I got appointed to the presidential cabinet to that position, did that for a while, then ended up as um, working with the tribal college um, and moved here to Utah, started the Utah League of Native American Voters. We've been doing a lot of advocacy around tribal issues um, and, uh, and then be, am now the policy director for this organization that serves the Great Basin area. So Nevada, Utah, uh, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, Arizona, parts of New Mexico where we work with all the tribes and the legislatures and state agencies on eliminating uh, sexual violence, uh, domestic assault, um, just sort of any type of violence within tribal communities. Um, and so just most recently, what, what we've done is we've got the state of Utah to pass and fund and establish a task force to study and understand how to end the crisis around murdered missing indigenous women um, we just got that task force um, up and going yesterday, and so I'm working on that right now, working with a number of consortia across the country with other Native academics and policy scholars and policymakers so we can figure out what, how best we can sort of arrest this crisis, um, not only in Utah, but across the country. And so um, that's the work I'm doing right now. Ah, that's awesome. That is really awesome. Great work. Great question. Um, uh, that was a question from Michael. So yeah, it's interesting to hear because you do, uh, you are an influencer and it's clear, um, I think in some of the scenes with you at the high school, uh, talking with youth and teaching that you're also a gifted teacher. Um, and I don't know, are you continuing in any way to do any teaching throughout this time? Um, not, not like that, but I, I have been um, trying to toy with the idea. I want to get some projects finished first, but toying with the idea of getting back and getting back into teaching, but, but nothing yet. He is a phenomenal teacher. And honestly, like, uh, I, I think one of Moroni's setbacks for his campaign is that he just easily gets too academic. You know, we talk about it in the film. And even when we were just getting to know him, we were still trying to sort of wrap our heads around what, like the, the full scope of his platform, because it was so complex and it was completely thought out. I think the first little pamphlet we got from you from your campaign was like very small letters and like 15 bullet points with all these <laughs> like great promoters, you know? Um, uh, and then we finally, when we filmed Verona speaking to a classroom of high school students about his platform, we both silent eye, we looked at each other, we're like, oh, now we, really get it you know because it's yeah. like learning it to high school students and apparently we were high school students but it just like and that's why that that team was so incredibly useful we got up at like 4 30 a.m by the way to drive to the high school so i'm glad we did um because uh, it was one of the most essential scenes that explain what it's all about yeah <laughs> i remember that yeah that, that was a, that was a fun day honestly yeah yeah yeah, yeah it gets um Figuring out how to talk to people during a political campaign can be really difficult because folks um, want sound bites, right? And policy isn't made up that way and good policy is definitely not made up that way. And so um, I know that that's got to be a challenge in learning how to um, talk about policy in a way that engages folks in it, um, but also that that helps to build the policy to be strong and useful and um, to, to have some teeth to it because policy that's built out of sound bites, you know, just often doesn't accomplish a whole lot. So that I think was a challenge that you faced in your campaign in terms of how to talk about your, um, your platform. 
No, no, I, 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 absolutely. Um, I, it, and, and this is like sort of just sort of revealing about just um, the campaign political process in the Navajo Nation itself, because I honestly still believe until I have evidence otherwise that our campaign was the first one to actually write a platform mm -hmm. and commit it to paper and have it accessible to people who wanted it. So people knew clearly what I stood for and and it's just, and so, so getting back to these sound bites, they weren't necessarily sound bites, but they were phrases that Navajos were used to that they, that politicians could keep talking about and using. Um, so like, so like Joe Shirley's campaign, I think his campaign was, was Navajo, was a Navajo theme, but it basically said, we move forward together. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what that means. No clue what that means, but it worked. It yeah. worked for them. Um, yeah, no one wants to talk I about the exercise of sovereignty. <laughs> I remember Moroni pushing the Shirley campaign, the front runner, <laughs> to release a platform. And then on election night when they won, they had still not released a platform. So then we, had, right before Moroni was offered a VP slot, Moroni goes like, can I get your platform now? Finally. <laughs> and then they were, were going to, I don't know if they ever did. No, that's, I was going to ask that question. Did you ever get the platform and what was it? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's crazy how the parallels with the national politics, and that's why I, I still, I think this film is still, uh, you know, it was filmed a, a while back, but it's still valid today. And because it's almost evergreen if you talk about what's going on in the national level, so. Yeah, very timely. I, I thought it was timely when I watched it. And then when I saw um, at the end of the film what the time frame was, I was like, oh, wow. Like, I didn't know or didn't realize this was, you know, several years ago. So it, yeah. it is as relevant as ever. Someone just commented more relevant than ever. So yeah. definitely a relevant film. So glad that people are watching it. Right. I, I was sort of hoping, and, and you'll forgive me for allowing me to um, indulge my own ego for a moment, but I was hoping Jasper would have included and Asila would have included someone calling me the Navajo Bernie Sanders at the time. Yes. <laughs> because that's what they were doing. <laughs> what was happening on camera? But also like, yeah, yeah, no, true. But also you became that, like, Bernie's big moment sort of happened after your moment. So yeah, you really foreshadowed what was going to happen on the national level. And I said, Stand by that statement. Right. We're ahead of your time. <laughs> so by the time AOC runs for president, you should run again because it has a ripple effect. <laughs> yeah, that's, I don't think that's going to happen. I, I don't have any more campaigns in me. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is um, 3.47, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Are there any closing thoughts or things that you want to pass on um, about the experience or um, about the film festivals in general and the importance of um, bringing together um, film as an expression of uh, the different stories that are out there to be told? Um. Yeah, I, I, I honestly think that um, not, not only this film, but, but just, I mean, this medium has been able to impact uh, just a number of people in different ways that I didn't anticipate. Um, and Jasper, probably like, like you, I'm getting just random emails every so often from different people about the film. Um, and oftentimes what, what it is, regardless of who of who's really asking uh, in terms of their background, it all comes out of like the film helped them in some ways. And that really has nothing to do with me. It's more of a tribute to how Jasper and Sila were able to tell that story um, appropriately. Because um, <clears throat> I've got my own expertise, but it's certainly not in like putting people at, at, at ease. I, I am not disarming, <laughs> but the story was, um, but it was also, and, and what I really like about this is, and what this film does and what film does uh, as well as allows you to see the critiques that, that are oftentimes um, inaccessible to a lot of people because they're in these like academic books or whatever, or yeah. Um, but, what, but what this film really did was it just made accessible what those critiques look like, um, what microaggressions look like on a daily basis, what 
uh, what sort of like, the, what, what is like sort of the existential, existential question at the core of indigeneity, honestly? And, and I think this film wrestles with that in such a good way. It, it doesn't resolve itself in any way either. It just sort of leaves it messy. And I don't know if that was intentional, but I thought it was brilliant because in the end, it just sort of says, okay, this is Navajo. Mm -hmm. This is messy. Mm -hmm. And it leaves it there. Mm -hmm. And that is the indigenous quintessential experience in their own communities. It, it, it's incredibly messy. And I think that's what film can do because uh, we can write academic papers and all this stuff about this and few people have it, but it's on PBS or Apple, on iTunes, it's accessible. People watch it, they watch a clip and they're like, oh my gosh, I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense. And so I think um, this particular medium, medium is, is far more, has a far, far wider reach um, than anything that academics could do, honestly. I mean, yeah. Not to say filmmakers aren't academics, I apologize for that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know what you mean, and you know it. It, it is uh, it, it just so exciting that thanks to Vision Maker and RTVS, we were able to bring this even to people. Because, like I said before, it can be a bit of a hard sell. You know, people are like, "Oh, that's too niche for me to to touch on any distributors whatsoever." And now we have a new distributor called Frameline in San Francisco, and they are going to re-release the film, and it's going to be on iTunes. And it's just like, I think because this is still an evergreen story. Um, I hope it will have a long afterlife, so to speak, and sort of gets discovered as this gem that foreshadowed mm -hmm. a lot. So Jasper, um, what new projects are you working on? What's coming next? Um, uh, I, I am back in Europe now. Um, I moved back temporarily. We'll see for how long. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to travel, or well, I want to travel around Europe and tell, uh, Queer stories in different countries once we're able to travel again. So that's what I'm currently setting up. Good, good. There are a lot of queer stories to be told, and um, because we, um, as a as someone who's a member of the community, um, we live in every community and in every part of the country and in every socioeconomic status, and in um, we speak, you know, all the different languages, and um, it's it's you know, we're everywhere. And that is just something that's so important to explore and to help people understand. Um, because, uh, you know, I know in our advocacy work at Out Nebraska, we, um, we deal with policymakers who don't believe that they have any people in the LGBTQIA plus two-spirit plus community living in their districts. Um, they just think we don't exist. And so it's so important to tell our stories um, and, and to look at the intersection of our stories and the different things that we're doing in the world and um, the different gifts that we're bringing and difference, the difference that we make um, just living our lives and running a campaign um, as Moroni did. So um, thank you both um, for being a part of this um, film um, for, um, please pass on my gratitude to your fellow filmmaker. I'm sorry she couldn't attend today. Well. Um, yes, but this has just been a really, really great experience. And um, we're having some thanks in the chat. People are thanking us for the great conversation. I think this uh, went really well. And I hope more people uh, view the, the film and the other films that are a part of the um, film festival. Um, this is a, a real gift for our community and the larger, broader community, and hopefully across the United States and in other countries to view these films and watch um, these stories. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I think that's all we've got today. And I hope that everyone has a great rest of your week. And um, Elena, thank you for Vision Maker Media for making this possible. Thank you all. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Marona. I missed you. Likewise, Jasper. Hopefully, we'll uh, in, in we'll real life. Sometime. Yeah. I'm sure, yeah. I love that. Yeah.